Hi everyone, thanks for joining us for this online event, whether you're watching on YouTube or Facebook uh, or watching at a later time. My name is Nicola Hunt and we're here tonight live streaming from the Riverside Church in Kaiapoi, which is also one of our civil defence centres when we need it and is also located within the yellow evacuation zone, which Brennan will explain a little bit later. Joining us is Justin and Brennan. Justin is a Natural Hazard Science Advisor at Environment Canterbury, working in the Natural Hazard Science team. Justin's main area of expertise is in understanding coastal processes and coastal hazards and applying that knowledge to better manage the risk to people and property from coastal hazards, including tsunami. Brennan is the Emergency Management Advisor for the Waimakariri District Council. He oversees civil defence in the district and is one of the key people responsible for making sure our communities stay safe. So what we'll cover tonight, Justin will be talking about Tsunami 101, Pegasus Bay Tsunami Hazards and the science behind the modelling and then Brennan will talk to us about Waimakariri's Tsunami Evacuation Zones, Tsunami Warnings, what to do and how to prepare. If you've got any questions, just pop them in the chat or comments box on YouTube or Facebook. And now I'm going to swap places with Justin and he's going to go over the science behind tsunamis with you. We'll be back in a tick. Thanks Nicola. Good evening everyone. So Waimakariri District has had um, tsunami evacuation zones since 2012 and they were based on some previous tsunami modelling. Tsunami modelling is basically um, just mathematical representation of tsunamis in real life. So they're simulations of, um, of a tsunami. Now as with many aspects of science and with, with modelling these, um, these models can become out of date. So we went through an exercise of redoing our tsunami modelling for, um, for Waimakariri District. Um, and the outputs of that modelling showed us that the previous modelling may have underestimated some of the worst case scenarios um, of tsunami inundation or tsunami flooding that could affect the district. So those, so that new science, we were able to input into determining these new evacuation zones that Brennan's going to talk to you a little bit more detail about later. So what are tsunami? Well, this is kind of what Hollywood would have you believe um, a tsunami looks like. In reality, um, the reality is actually probably quite different. There's a very, very wide range of different tsunami that can occur, ranging from very small, hardly detectable ones through to the very, very large ones. But I can probably assure you that, that something like this is not likely to occur in the Waimakariri district. Just an example of some of those um, very small, almost undetectable um, tsunami that we do get from time to time in the Canterbury coast. The, the image on the left here is um, some traces of tsunami gauges which are scattered around the country. Um, these are really sensitive pieces of equipment that measure um, tsunami waves as they, as they travel um, up, up the coast. Um, as we can see, um, this is an example from 20, uh, 2009. Um, there was a rather large um, tsunami in Samoa. Um, it was a magnitude eight. Um, it took about seven hours to reach um, Canterbury. Um, and we can see just here, here is our, um, our gauge, our tsunami, ga tsunami gauge at Littleton. And this one is at Sumner Head. So we see the, uh, the earthquake went off, take about seven hours for the first, tsunamis, uh, first tsunami um, waves to reach, um, reach, the can reach the Canterbury gauges. And this, although it was a very devastating tsunami in um, Samoa itself, the wave heights in Christchurch were probably no more than about 10 centimetres. Another example, a little more recently, um, on the right here, on the 5th of March um, earlier this year, 
Um, there are a series of earthquakes um, occurred off East Cape, East Cape in the North Island um, and up towards the Kermadex um, north of East Cape. And again, here is our, here is our, here is our trace of uh, tsunami gauges. We can see um, the first earthquake was a 7.3 um, just off East Cape, and that was a very localised um, localized event. You can see the, the tsunami trace for the East Cape gauge, um, the earthquake goes off, and then a matter of um, maybe half an hour later, we had uh, tsunami waves of about one metre um, occurring at the East Cape gauge. Um, but you notice very, very little else. If we look down to, uh, to Christchurch, um, no trace of tsunami at all from, from that event. A few hours later, on that same day, the Kermadec, um, there was an earthquake up in the Kermadex. This was a much larger event. This was an 8.1 um, magnitude event. Um, and again, uh, obviously had quite a big effect uh, locally. Um, here are our Rao Island um, in the Kermadec, um, the Kermadec Islands uh, tsunami traces, and they were actually knocked out either by the earthquake or by the, by the tsunami. Um, but again, if we look at the rest of the country, very little impacts um, after, that, after that earthquake um, were felt. One of the biggest uh, tsunami to affect Canterbury in recent times um, was after a, a tsunami in 2010 um, from Chile. Now this was uh, again a very, very large earthquake, um, a magnitude 8.8. It uh, took about 14 hours to arrive from um, Chile to, to, to Canterbury. Um, and when the waves got to, got to us, they were probably in the order of um, half a metre to a metre. So relatively large, uh, large waves. Obviously, the waves of that height are not, um, not, not large enough to um, cause any, any flooding. But what we did experience, um, as you can see in these, in these images, um, is they can set up very strong and unusual currents um, in our coastal environment. Um, for example, uh, on the left-hand side, we've got uh, the uh, O'Kane's Bay estuary. You can kind of see the, the swirling eddies that uh, this particular tsunami um, in 2010 um, caused. Uh, and similarly, um, the one on the right is at uh, Caroline Bay in, in Timaru. Um, again, you can see the, the swirling eddies that, uh, that occurred um, as, the, as the tsunami wave came into, um, came into the bay. So these are probably some of the more likely and more regular tsunami events that we will experience here. Um, events that will only really um, not inundate, but could cause um, dangerous conditions within our water bodies themselves. Then obviously on the other, on the other side of things, we can get these very large, um, devastating tsunami events. Um, for example, um, the unfortunate events that happened in Japan in 2011. This was a massive earthquake, a magnitude nine. Um, locally in Japan, it caused waves of up to around 15 meters um, in some areas. Um, but after that, after that uh, tsunami, reverberated around the earth. Um, we did feel that in Canterbury as well. The waves in Canterbury um, were probably around half a metre um, in height. So it caused similar um, kind of funny tidal currents and variations um, in sea levels to a very small magnitude around our coastline. So what are tsunami? Well, generally, um, a tsunami is um, caused by some disturbance of the entire water column or the entire um, column of, of seawater above, say, a fault, for example. Um, obviously, faults are not the only, under, underwater faults are not the only causes of, of tsunami. Tsunami can also be caused by um, large landslides falling into a, into a water body or ocean. They can be caused by volcanic eruptions doing a similar sort of thing, disturbing the water column. Um, but by, by, far, by far the most common uh, mechanism for causing a tsunami is an, under, an underwater fault line going off. And the important distinction between a, a, a tsunami wave 
and just your normal ocean wave um, is that fact that the tsunami wave disturbs all of the column of water. Um, ocean waves are caused by the wind, they're caused by the wind blowing across the, um, across the surface of the water, and only the very top few metres of, um, of, of the ocean is disturbed by a, um, by a wind wave. Um, whereas with a tsunami, um, it's that entire water column. Um, and that's a very important consideration um, when we look at the differences between a, a tsunami wave and a, and a wind wave. Now, tsunami waves are also called um, long period waves. A period is basically the, the time difference it takes for the crest of a wave to reach a certain, a certain point. Um, tsunami waves uh, can be up to, you know, tens, often hundreds of kilometres long in terms of their wavelength. Um, but what they do do in, in deep water is they don't have much height. So probably even the very largest tsunamis won't have a height greater than about a metre or a metre and a half going through the, through the water column. But the thing that they do do is they just move incredibly fast. So tsunamis can move at about the same, um, same speed as a jet, a jet plane. So we're talking 700 to 900 kilometres an hour. And the deeper the water, the faster they move. So tsunamis move very, really fast in deep water. But as they progress across the, across the ocean, um, and they come into contact with shallower parts of the ocean, they slow down. And when they approach shore, they slow down um, even more. So what we tend to get is that the initial crest of the wave um, slows down. The crest, in, the, the, the crest of the wave in behind, though, is still going at that same, at that same, pa at that, that same pace. Um, so the, the distance between the waves tend to shorten. But remember, we've still got that energy, that whole energy of the water column um, under, those, uh, under those crests. And what happens, all that energy gets trans transformed into an upwards, upwards movement. So that's when we get these, um, these, the wave height builds up when it reaches the shore. The wave slows down, but even though it slows down, when it reaches the shore and when it inundates the, inundates the land, it can still be moving at um, speeds of up to 40 kilometres an hour. So speeds that are much, much more than we would be able to run. And one way you can think about tsunami waves when they reach the shore is not necessarily one of these large Hollywood type massive breaking waves. They're gonna be look a lot more like um, a very fast incoming tide. Um, and another aspect of that is that we're going to get, um, not only is it in, a, a large, fast incoming wave, that wave will also um, recede as well. So over, whereas a wind wave, for example, um, from the ocean, might only, you, you might get a wave breaking every you know, 10 to 15 seconds, um, a tsunami wave will come in and break and it will keep breaking and keep breaking and keep moving for, for, for several minutes, maybe even an hour. So you've got all, and it's all that big, that massive water within that wave that causes the, the damage in these, in these very big events. And that's what makes um, tsunami so dangerous. How, an, how a tsunami will impact um, us depends on a number of um, a number of variables. The first is kind of the, the earthquake location and size. So as we've said, if a, um, it had really has to, uh, the earthquake really has to occur under the water, the fault actually has to um, push up that column of water. Um, and obviously the, the size, the amount of energy released in, a, in an earthquake is, is very important too. And different faults will move in, in, in many, many different ways. Um, so uh, the same magnitude earthquake um, depending on how the fault moved um, after the earthquake, what part of the fault moved, um, will really depend on whether or not um, a tsunami is actually generated or whether it's a smaller tsunami or a, or a big tsunami. As I've also said, the shape of the sea floor um, and the, the shape of the coastline is very important. Um, obviously, tsunamis slow down 
in shallow water and speed up in deeper water. They also can bend around um, coastlines and bays. They are ampli am amplified, for example, um, in narrow harbours. Um, and also the, the state of the tide is a very important um, element too when we're, when we're looking at the impacts of, of tsunami. So obviously if we get, for an example, a, uh, you know, a three or four metre tsunami affecting the coastline um, of Canterbury, um, our tidal range is around two metres. So if that four metre tsunami, for, for example, arrived at, um, at low tide, you might be looking only at effects of, um, you know, above the normal high tide level of, of a metre or so. Whereas if, if that four metre tsunami occurred at high tide, you would get the full brunt of that four metres of extra water um, occurring at high tide. So the state of the tide is, a very, is, a, is very much a consideration. Um, so all those elements make um, figuring out if a tsunami will flood, um, flood land um, quite, quite, quite tricky. So this is um, a map of obviously New Zealand, um, but also a map of the um, the different colours represent the different um, different water depths um, off the coast of New Zealand. And also, as you see, New Zealand is obviously very tect tectonically active, um, which makes um, which makes us quite vulnerable to these um, to these local and um, and regional source um, tsunamis. New Zealand obviously straddles um, two continental plates, as we can see here on the um, on the right hand side is the is the Pacific plate, and on the left is the um, Australian plate. Um, so the the Pacific plate is diving under the Australian plate, um, and where these um, where these plates um, join and where one goes under the other, um, they're called subduction zones. So there's three main con subduction zones that we have in, in New Zealand. Um, there's the Kermadec subduction zone up, up north of New Zealand, stretching up to the Kermadec Islands. Um, there's the Hikarangi subduction zone um, off the east coast of the North Island. Um, and then the Pusiga subduction zone um, off the south, south island of the, of the country. Um, so this makes, and these subduction zones are quite um, vulnerable to quite large potentially tsunami generating earthquakes. Pegasus Bay is exposed to, I guess we call them three different tsunami sources. Uh, the first one is local source tsunami. So local source um, tsunamis are tsunamis that we would expect um, less than an hour's warning to arrive, um, to arrive at the coast. So for us in Pegasus Bay, we're talking um, any tsunami source um, upwards towards um, within Pegasus Bay itself, but also up towards Kaikoura and even to the southern part of the Hikarangi subduction zone. Um, probably if, a, if, a, you know, if an earthquake that generated a tsunami went off there, we would expect sort of an hour or less warning for, um, for that tsunami to affect us. Um, the second type are regional source tsunamis. So we can see on our, on our map here, this thick um, grey line, hopefully you can see that okay, this thick grey line. So that's kind of an area where we expect um, regional, regional tsunamis to, to occur. And these are the tsunamis that we would expect probably um, would take between one and three hours to arrive um, on the Pegasus Bay, um, Bay shoreline. Now these are the kind of the tsunamis that you would probably, um, the earthquakes that generated them, you, you would probably um, feel them um, as, a, as, a, as a long earthquake. Um, not necessarily strong because they're a little, little bit further away, but you would expect them to be long rolling motions of an, earth, of an earthquake. And the, the, third, the, third, um, the third tsunami source that uh, we are, um, we're vulnerable to are distant source tsunamis. So these are tsunamis kind of outside this grey blobby line, thus, thus tsunamis that we could expect um, would take greater than three hours um, to reach us. So as an example, um, distant source tsunamis might be, um, might be sourced um, from South America, Central America, even Alaska, and as we said before, Japan, we do get um, tsunamis um, 
if they're generated this far away, can still, can still reach us and still, and still affect us. In fact, some of the biggest tsunami that have affected uh, the, the Canary Coast have been from these distant source um, tsunamis, and that's what our modelling tells us as well. Um, particularly our, our vulnerable to, um, to tsunamis generated from, from South America. They've got an uninter uninterrupted um, travel distance and, and run all the way from South America, bang, into, into, Pegasus, into Pegasus Bay. So, central government tells us for our, when we're designing our evacuation zones um, that we have to, model the evacu have to model evacuation zones based on what we call a worst case tsunami. So we're obviously um, evacuation zones are for life safety. So we want to um, plan for the worst, but hope for the best. Um, and when we say worst case, and as I'm going through some of these examples, the worst case you can think of um, as about us, we could expect an event of this size to occur, you know, once in every 2,500 years. But probably a better way to think about that is in terms of a human lifespan. So say, for example, if, a, um, if the average human lifespan is kind of 80 years, um, we would expect an event of this size, a one in 2,500 year event, um, perhaps to, to happen, have a 3% chance of happening in someone's lifetime. So very unlikely, but certainly, um, certainly possible. And we really, need to, um, we really need to plan for those unlikely but possible large life-threatening events. We had GNS Science do the, do the tsunami modelling um, for us. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, the previous um, modelling that was done for, uh, for the Waimakatari District um, back in 2012 used one single um, scenario. It was a scenario of a large earthquake going off um, in, South, in South America. Now with the, um, the latest modelling, what GNS Science have done is they've actually modelled hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different types of, of, um, of, of tsunami and um, done what they call an ensemble, um, an ensemble model. So basically pushed all those, um, all those results together to find a worst case scenario. And these are what these, um, these models show us. So just by way of example, what I've got here is um, one, of these, one of these kind of worst case scenario um, earthquakes, uh, tsunami generating earthquakes. Um, and this one here is a nine magnitude earthquake um, on the southern Hikarangi subduction zone. So where our, where our red blob is here, this is an earthquake happening um, towards the end of the Hikarangi subduction zone, kind of offshore. Um, from Cook Strait, so the very southern, the so southern end. So this is kind of bordering on our um, local slash regional source tsunami. So the travel time is likely to be um, one hour or even less than one hour for the first waves to arrive. Um, and we would expect wave heights of up to nine meters above normal sea level um, to occur. But as I said, this is the, this is, this is the worst of the worst case um, scenarios. Um, it's very, very hard to model or predict um, what size uh, earthquake will cause what size tsunami waves, um, but this is what we believe to be the most credible worst case scenario for, for, for an earthquake like this. Um, and the picture on the, on the right hand side basically shows what we could expect uh, the inundation or the flooding to be like from a tsunami of this, of this size from, generated from this particular location. Um, and if we look a little bit closer, um, the most vulnerable areas of, of the district, um, what, the modeling, what the modeling showed us is that the, the coastal dunes um, of the Wamak area district, we've got some nice, big, lovely, well-vegetated, healthy sand dunes. Um, so they are likely to um, absorb and stop much of the direct inundation from, um, from a tsunami like this, but we would expect the, 
the flooding to come is in our low-lying areas around our river mouths. So up near our Ashley River Mouth and Waimakariri River Mouth. Um, the inundation is expected to come up the river mouths and flood around the back of the, the back of the dunes and around the back of the back of the beach, rather than directly overtopping the dunes themselves. Uh, the second, the second uh, example we've got here, or the second um, tsunami scenario, um, is a magnitude three earthquake um, up at the uh, the uh, southern um, Kumadek subduction zone. So around off our east, off our east cape um, area. Travel times for this one, we're looking at around uh, two meters for the first waves to arrive. And again, similarly to our to our previous example we'd expect wave heights of up to nine metres above normal sea level. But again, this is the worst case and they could be, they could be much less, could be much less. And just a third example um, of, a, of, a, of a scenario is, is one of our distant source um, tsunami. Earthquake off the coast of, of South America a really, really large earthquake, a magnitude 9.45 earthquake. Now to put that into perspective, um, the biggest ever recorded tsunami, uh, sorry, the biggest ever recorded earthquake um, since we've been able to, able to measure these things um, was in a 9.5 earthquake. So this kind, of, this, kind of, uh, this kind of earthquake that we're talking about in this scenario is getting up there pretty much with the largest earthquake that's ever been recorded. Um, a tsunami generated uh, in this location, travel time to New Zealand or to, to the Canary Coast would be about 15, 15 or 16 hours, um, but the wave heights could be up to 12 metres above sea level. So really, really quite, quite large, um, large waves could be expected from, a, from, an, from an earthquake um, from this location. And again, Similar example uh, in terms of our um, inundation extent um, coming in through the, the mouths of the, of the Ashley and the Waimaki, Waimaki River rivers, but extending quite a bit further inland. But we also asked um, GNS to model um, several different tsunamis generated by, um, that could cause maybe smaller um, smaller sized um, events. Okay, so um, we've talked about these worst case scenarios, but as I said before, we're more than likely to get waves, tsunami waves um, that are slightly smaller than this. So it's interesting to know what, uh, what areas those smaller type events could, um, could inundate. Um, so this is just, a, just, a, just an example of, okay, so if we got a three meter um, tsunami, what areas would, would be affected. Um, and for uh, the Waimaki area district, obviously um, we're, looking, we're looking pretty good. Um, maybe just some, uh, some minor um, inundation, again, around the, the river mouths um, at the, uh, the Waimaki area and the, um, the, the Ashley estuaries, but certainly no, um, no inundation um, anywhere else. We did a similar sort of thing for um, a five metre wave. So I'm up, you know, a significantly higher wave than, than, than the three metres. Um, and again, really interesting to see that very little, um, very little impact um, behind, the, behind the dunes for most of the, most of the coast. And again, limited to our, um, to our river mouth environments. But probably one of the, one of the good news stories to come out of the modelling is that um, it's unlikely that any of the offshore faults um, off Pegasus Bay themselves. Um, GNS looked at 20 different fault sources within Pegasus Bay, and when they modelled them, none of, those, um, none of those earthquakes generated by these faults would be big enough to cause a tsunami um, any greater than, than three metres. Just give a little bit um, of a rundown on um, how we know a tsunami is coming and uh, the warnings associated, associated with them. We don't really know for sure whether a tsunami is being generated um, 
until it reaches one of our um, coastal sea level gauges or one of our um, dart buoys. Now, um, a dart buoy it stands for um, Deep Water Assessment and Reporting um, of Tsunami. And these are um, very sensitive um, devices um, placed on the sea floor, um, connected to a buoy, which, will, uh, which sends the signal from them um, to instrumentation um, on shore. Um, so, when there's, so really when there's, an, when there's a very large earthquake, um, the initial response is, okay, is this uh, in a location or a position um, on the planet that could cause a tsunami somewhere? Um, that's the only indication to go by. And it's not until a, a tsunami reaches one of these um, early detection um, buoys or gauges that we really have an indication that yes, there is actually a tsunami um, that has occurred. And obviously not just around New Zealand, but these dark buoys are scattered all around, all around the Pacific. Um, and they basically are early warning detection that, a, that, an, that, a, that an earthquake um, has caused um, a tsunami. But I think the thing, the, thing to, uh, the thing to note about tsunami warnings is that there is just so much information being fed um, to the scientists um, all the time. Um, the initial earthquake magnitude is often takes a while to, um, to be refined. So often the initial magnitude that, that, that is recorded um, will be changed as the earthquake waves generate around the, the, around the earth. Um, and a very subtle difference in earthquake magnitude could make quite a big difference to the size um, of, the, of the tsunami. And all these things take time. So, um, so it can take a while for the relevant authorities um, to, to make a decision that there has been an, uh, there is a tsunami coming and how big it is and what areas should be, should be evacuated. And this is just an example um, of some of the information that, that, that comes to um, our local civil defence authorities when there has been a, um, a, tsunami, a tsunami warning. Um, so our local authorities will get, um, get a threat map um, with um, what our, what our um, national experts think based on the information that they've received um, either from overseas or from locally, from our own um, tsunami gauges or our own dart buoys as to which areas might be affected, um, which areas won't be affected, and to, and to what degree. Um, and then this information is used by our local um, civil defence authorities um, to generate um, tsunami evacuation warnings, which Brendan will, will talk to you a little bit more about in a minute. Um, so I guess from me, some of the take-homes is that most tsunamis are small and won't flood land. Um, but they can still cause dangerous currents um, in the sea and river mouth areas. Pegasus Bay, though, is still vulnerable to some of these large tsunami, um, both from a, um, a regional source and a distant source. And although they're rare, they can, um, they, they, they do have the potential to cause quite a bit of damage. Brendan's going to talk about evacuation zones, so if you know you're in an evacuation zone, have a plan. And the final message that again, Brendan will, will reinforce is um, because, of, because of what I've told you about the length of time that it can take to actually pinpoint where and how big a tsunami might, might be, could take several hours. And sometimes for these local source and regional source tsunamis, you don't have several hours several hours to wait. Um, so a natural warning is probably the best warning. So if you feel a long or strong earthquake, get gone from those red and orange zones. Um, don't wait for someone to tell you what to do. Um, so now I'll hand over to, to Brennan to, to go through a little bit more about um, what the tsunami evacuation zones um, are and entail for, um, for the Waimaka Area District.
Tenakoto Katoa. I'm going to talk now about our evacuation zones. And as Justin said earlier, the evacuation zones are not identical to the tsunami inundation zones. In some cases, we've had to stretch the evacuation zones out to meet the nearest road. And in other cases, we've had to shrink the evacuation zone to meet the nearest road. We want to use the roads as boundaries because they're things that people can identify with, particularly local residents know most of the streets nearby to their homes, so they're easy reference points for them uh, if they ever have to evacuate. So our first evacuation zone is the red zone. And the colour coding system that we're using here is a national standard across New Zealand throughout the civil defence sector. So you will find the same sorts of colours being used in Christchurch City and Hurunui to our north. So our red zone is the area most likely to be affected by tsunami. And for us, in its simplest terms, it's pretty much the beach sandy area. And at the river mouths, so where the people are fishing, where people are swimming, where children are building their sand castles in the summertime, the beach sandy area and the river mouths, particularly the Ashley and the Waimakariri river mouths, are the areas you need to be worrying about as far as our red zone is concerned. So, if you feel a long or strong earthquake, one that lasts for a minute or longer, or nearly sweeps you off your feet, you need to get gone. Get away from the red zone as quickly as possible. Don't wait for a warning. If you hear the sea making loud, unusual noises, or you see the sea behaviour, the water behaving in a way that's most unusual, get gone. Get out of there straight away. If you hear a civil defence warning system telling you to evacuate, get out of the red zone straight away. Our next zone is the orange zone. So this is an area inland that is potentially going to be inundated when tsunami occurs. Similarly to the red zone, there's a good chance you're going to feel the earthquake that causes the evacuation of the orange zone. So once again, if you feel a long or strong earthquake, get gone. If you hear the sea making unusual noises or you see the seawater behaving in a really unusual way, get gone. Or if you hear a civil defence warning to evacuate the orange zone, get gone straight away. Our next zone is the yellow zone. So this is an area that is possibly going to be inundated by tsunami. It is less likely than the orange zone or the red zone that this area will be inundated. It is most likely that you're not going to feel the earthquake that causes this. So this is probably going to come from a distant source tsunami from perhaps South America. It could take as long as 12 to 17 hours approximately from the time of the first earthquake before the first tsunami wave arrives on our shores and you will not feel the earthquake that causes this. So your only warning really is going to be official warnings from civil defence. So if you hear the warnings to evacuate the yellow zone, evacuate immediately. Then we have the white zones or the areas that are not part of our formal official tsunami evacuation zones. So if you're outside the red, the orange and the yellow zones, you are in a zone that is deemed safe. You are not at risk of earthquake when you're in these zones. So even if you hear a official warning to evacuate because of tsunami, you do not need to evacuate the white zone. If you live in this area, you might even want to open up your home as a safe refuge place for people who are evacuating from any of the other zones. So I explained before that I was going to zoom into the maps and show you how our evacuation zones um, have evolved. What you're looking at on the screen right now is what used to be our tsunami evacuation zones. And you can see that they are one, two, three, four separate polygons. And because of the new science assessment, this has now changed, and these are no longer our tsunami evacuation zones. What you're seeing here is our new evacuation zones, and it's pretty much one large polygon with the three different coloured zones in it. So this map is the Council's publicly available map. You can go into this map at any time through the Council's website, and you can go into an exact version of this through Environment Canterbury's website as well. And if you think you live inside or near one of these evacuation zones, you can go into the window there, and just like Google Earth, you can insert your property address, and it will take you in right to where your property is. And I'm just going to randomly pick a property 
inside Kaiapoi. And we can see now that our map has taken us right to that property address and the colour zoning there is orange and if you were to touch on your property a little balloon will pop up and will tell you where your address is and it will tell you in words which of the tsunami evacuation zones you are in. And through this mapping system you can zoom in or out, you can change the, the background so that it looks like an aerial satellite map just like you see on Google Earth or you can change it into a topographical map for those people who like to use contour lines. I'm going to talk now about our tsunami warnings. So there isn't just one type of warning system. We have a layered system. And there are generically two types of warning. There are natural warning signs and there are official warning signs. So the natural warning signs. Once again, if you feel a long or strong earthquake, one that lasts about a minute or longer, or one that nearly sweeps you off your feet, get gone. Get out of the tsunami evacuation zones straight away unless you're in the yellow zone and you can afford to wait for the official warning, but you're not going to feel that earthquake anyway. The second natural si sign is that the sea makes a really unusual noise or you see the seawater behaving in a weird way. Perhaps it looks like most of the seawater has sucked back out into the Pacific Ocean and so you need to quickly get out of that area straight away. And the third one is if you hear the loud noise of the sea, it sounds really unusual, perhaps like a jet engine or a train, that's a good sign to get out of the area. Looking at the official tsunami warning signs that civil defence will issue, there's a series of six layers, and we're going to use all of these at the same time. So the very first one is the emergency mobile alert system. This is a system that is owned by central government, it's activated by the National Emergency Management Agency in Wellington and it will target any cell phone that is capable of receiving an alert. You don't subscribe to these, they will automatically turn up on your phone if your phone is capable of receiving them. Listen to those warnings and adhere to whatever they say. The next one is radio and television. So at the national level, the National Emergency Management Agency will broadcast messages over TV. They have an arrangement with New Zealand TV to make that happen rather instantly. And nationally, regionally and locally, Civil Defence is using nearby radio stations. For the Waimakariri District and all of North Canterbury, we are using Radio Compass FM, so 104.9 Compass FM, and you will hear messages coming across there, and our council will broadcast messages through that radio station live for as long as we need to. The council website and the council Facebook page are probably our primary source of um, intelligence and reliable information from the council. So we will be posting information on both of these platforms instantly when we know that tsunami threat is prevailing. So our next one are coastal warning siren systems and currently in Waikuku Beach, Wood End Beach and Pines Kairaki Beach we have siren systems that are connected to a computer console in Rangiora and we will broadcast messages through those sirens. Our sirens have some pre-recorded messages, some that are specifically about tsunami and we also have the ability to broadcast live voice messages through those siren systems. So listen for those. You are likely to hear a loud siren noise first, followed by a pre-recorded message, and then possibly followed by some live voice recorded messages. And then our final layer is emergency services people, our responders going door to door, knocking on those homes that are in the beach areas or inside the evacuation zones to tell you you must leave. And this is probably going to be our last port of call, but as I say, all six of these layers of warning will be occurring at the same time. So there's an example of our coastal warning siren system. There is one lamppost in each of Waikuku Beach, Ward End Beach and Pines Kairaki Beach. The array of sirens on the top of those are very similar, but what they can do is identical. And we can control that from Rangiora or remotely via cell phone 
or two-way radio that council owns, and certain staff have access to that. How should you prepare? So we have a lot of information that we push out to the public through our libraries, through the council service centres. Sometimes we'll drop them into reasonably public places like um, medical clinics, and there's lots of booklets with lots of information about how your family can prepare itself and prepare its household emergency kit box. So if you already have a household emergency plan with some evacuation arrangements in it, follow that plan. Get yourself to the family's assembly area, and if that happens to be outside of our tsunami evacuation zones, then you're in a good stead. If your plan doesn't do that, just make sure you get outside of the tsunami evacuation zone. And within our district, the Waimakariri, pretty much if you get west of State Highway 1, you're going to be safe. As you can see from our tsunami evacuation zones, and I'll blow that up shortly on a map, there are a couple of areas just west of State Highway 1 where the evacuation zones extend, but they are mainly unoccupied pasture lands. So what to do when you evacuate? Grab your household emergency kit, your grow bag, if you have one of those, and get yourselves as quickly as possible with medicines, with your children, your babies, with your pets, and out of the evacuation zone as quickly as possible. Secure your home as you normally would when you leave home to go to work each day. It's quite possible you will have to remain outside the evacuation zone for several hours, perhaps even days, depending on how much damage has been done. Stay informed. There are different ways to get information out of the council. And we will be broadcasting information to the public about which civil defence centres you can evacuate to, and we'll be putting maps up on Facebook and the council's website to show exactly where they are. Where they are, which ones we use, can change on the day depending on how the science assessment tells us that the water inundation is going to look. Listen to the local radio, particularly Compass FM if you're in the Waimakari district or if you're anywhere in North Canterbury. Making your plan. First of all, know your zone. Know which tsunami evacuation zone you are in or which one is closest to you and where to go to get out of it quickly. Have an evacuation plan for your household and if you don't have a template for that, the council provides those through our booklets that are available in each of the council service centres and libraries. Discuss your plan with your family members, particularly your children, so that everybody knows what the plan says, where to meet and how you will do that. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes my part of the presentation. I'll be happy to take any questions. So that concludes the presentation tonight and now we will move on to questions and answers. Uh, our first question from Dan, uh, will Pegasus and Kaiapoi be getting tsunami sirens now that they're in tsunami zones? Uh, Brennan, I think that's probably a good question for you. Yeah, so um, this is a really good question. Each of our beach communities has something in common and that is pretty much a single road in and out. So congestion is a potential risk in most of the areas, particularly the beach communities. And Pegasus itself has a very similar feature about its community. But it's important to remember that Pegasus is sitting inside an orange zone for most of the parts of Pegasus that are affected. And there's a very small area that's in the yellow zone. And both the orange and the yellow zones, we do have time for those evacuations. So the parts of Pegasus that are orange which is only a very small part, are going to have approximately one to three hours notice uh, from the time the earthquake occurs before the first wave would be expected to arrive. So yes, congestion, getting out of that uh, one route uh, is an issue, but you don't have to go far and you don't have to leave Pegasus Township because where the school hall is, is a designated evacuation centre and it is in the clear. So it's quite safe to go to Pegasus Township Hall. Uh, in terms of Woodend, it's like the other beach communities, so you do need to think about giving yourself time to get out of there. And people also need to be prepared that if they think the roads are too congested, think about walking, think about leaving the car behind. That may have to occur in some places, in some instances. Great, thank you, Brennan. And a question from Liam. 
Does the modelling take into account the current models and data on predicted sea level rise? And how much does this change current inundation zones? Justin. Yeah, thanks, um, thanks Liam, for that question. Um, the modelling um, assumes that the tsunami will occur at, um, at high tide, um, just to be uh, on the conservative side, on the safe side. Um, and obviously, as sea levels rise, that base level on which the modelling applies um, will increase as well. But really what we're interested in um, for evacuation um, zoning is what's happening in the here and now. Um, and sea levels probably in the next 10 years or so, um, we're, we're thinking that they you know, potentially could rise between you know, 10 and 20 centimetres um, in the next 10 years. But that's also kind of the time period where we'd be looking at um, reassessing um, the evacuation zones and redoing the, the modelling. Um, so um, in, you know, in a few years' time, when we do reevaluate the modelling, um, we'll take into account the sea level rise that's, that's happened subsequently. Um, yeah, so the answer is that the, the modelling at the moment doesn't, um, but any future modelling will, um, will, will take into, into, into consideration those, um, those uh, historic sea level rise. Great, thanks Justin. Uh, and a question from Rick. How big was the Kermadec Island tsunami when it took out the tsunami sensors? Back to you again, Justin. Um, unfortunately, we don't know because I believe it was the earthquake, the effects of the earthquake that knocked out the tsunami sensors. Um, I think some equipment fell over and power, power, was, uh, power was lost to the, to the actual tsunami, um, tsunami gauge on Raoul Island. Um, so um, we're not really sure how, how large that, that tsunami was there, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, we have another question from Liam. Has the WDC and Civil Defence specified where people should go if specific areas are being asked to be evacuated to avoid congestion? And are there preferred evacuation routes to take? Kia ora, Liam. So the answer uh, in the long is yes. So something that we're still in the process of doing is replacing all of the current signage and tsunami information boards that are on our coastline. We've only just very recently come up with the new tsunami evacuation zones themselves. So it takes us a bit of time now to produce new maps, new signage, replace what's out there already. So in the current signage, we did show where the evacuation routes are, where the evacuation centres are, and we plan to do that with the new round of signage that will be going up over the next year or two. Thanks, Brennan. Well, that looks like it wraps up our questions and answers for this evening. So thanks again, everybody, for joining us and um, for asking some really good questions. If you do think of anything else, uh, we're here to answer them. Just contact the council uh, through our Facebook page or contact our customer services team. Uh, thanks again and have a great evening. <laughs>